It's wrong button. What if there's an F and there's no F on the scale? Then leave it blank and write an F at the very end. Okay, so regulation of thyroid hormone, we talked about its metabolic effects, and you should be able to draw a flow chart at this point with thyroid hormone. So what's the name of the organ that starts this whole pathway? Hypothalamus. What chemical on here is released by the hypothalamus? TRH. TRH goes to what gland or organ? What pituitary? Anterior pituitary and releases what? TSH. TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, goes where? To the thyroid and causes it to release what? T3 and T4. And then you should have a list of the metabolic effects that we've already talked about. Things like increases sympathomimetic effects, like does what to your heart rate? Goes up. What happens to your blood pressure? Goes up. What happens to your temperature? As a result of what going up? Metabolism going up. Right. So the initiating effects, number one of initiating effect is that your hypothalamus acts like a thermostat for T3 and T4. In other words, if your T3 and T4 drop below 100%, what's it do? What's the hypothalamus do? It turns on, right? It turns on and releases TRH. If you have too much T3 and T4, what's the hypothalamus do? Shuts off. So it's trying to keep that 100% level, and most of the hormones are like that. The hypothalamus acts like a, like a thermostat to regulate or control or monitor that you have 100% in your level. And the example I gave you the first day was of testosterone. If somebody takes artificial testosterone, what's it do to their level? It goes way over. So they may take two or 300 times more te artificial testosterone than they naturally have in their body, which tells the hypothalamus what? Holy crap, it's hot in here, right? So it's way too high, and it shuts off. And then you know the effects of that. Right. So things that regulate thyroid hormone, of course, are the different hormones that are doing it. Exposure to cold and newborn infant, and to a smaller extent, it still does the same thing in us as adults. So you should have a flow chart like this. What you should have up here are what turn it on or something that actually inhibits it. Did I say in class something that inhibits it? Guess not. Stress. So stress actually inhibits the hypothalamus. Too much stress is going to do what to your metabolism? slows it down. What's going to do to your weight? So if you were worried about being fat before, you just created a positive feedback loop, right? And then here's how the, the book has it. So like I said, you can draw it just a normal, simple way for your notes so it's a quick reference guide. Because every hormone we talk about, you have to know what stimulates the release, you have to know where it comes from, and what was the last thing? What it's final effect is, right? So you should be able to know the pathway, what stimulates it, where it comes from, and then its final effects down here. Okay, so which one of the following is false about thyroid hormone? Which is false about thyroid hormone? Did we already do this question? No. Oh, I feel like we already did. Mm. So how about number one? True or false? T4 is the most abundant, but T3 is the most active? Yeah. That one's true, so we can get rid of that one. We're looking for a false statement. Number two, T3 functions in controlling metabolic rate? And that one's true, so we can get rid of it. How about TH is made from tyrosine? <coughs> Thyroid hormones made from tyrosine. Yes, that's true. Sure is. So what do you know about number four? False. It has to be false. And remember, this one can actually be stored up. It's stored up as what? It's not T3 or T4 it's stored at. It's actually stored as T1 and T2. Remember when we were talking about triiodothyronine and, and uh, tetraiodothyronine? Those are T3 and T4, but you have to build it off of a T1 and a T2, which is monoiodothyronine and diiodothyronine. So if you didn't remember that, you still got it right because you did what with the first three? Eliminate them. You knew those for a fact that these were all true, so it had to be number four. By the way, the other part of this question number four is thyroid hormone, is it lipophilic or lipophobic? So does it like or hate fat? Remember, it's a tyrosine hormone. There are two tyrosine hormones. One loved water and one loved fat. Which one loved fat? 
thyroid hormone loved fat. So is it lipophilic or lipophobic? It's lipophilic. What were the other ones, the ones that loved water? The catecholamines, like epinephrine, norepinephrine. Do they work quickly? Yes, they do. What do you know about water-loving hormones? Do they work quickly? Very. What do you know about these fat-loving hormones? They work slowly. Yeah, thyroid hormone takes a little time to regulate. It doesn't fix itself overnight. All right, next section, abnormalities. So this first euthyroidism is actually not an abnormality. This is normal levels. So this is normal levels of thyroid hormone. Youth thyroidism's normal levels of thyroid hormone. Okay. Hypothyroidism means what happened to your thyroid hormone? It's low. What if I tell you it's primary hypothyroidism? What's broken? The thyroid. If it's secondary, what could be broken? Anything else? What two things do you want to look at first, though? Anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus. All right, so some of the signs or symptoms here, myxedema. Myxedema is a puffiness or a swelling of the tissues. A lot of times it happens around joints, like around the knees. It can happen to the lower legs, which aren't joints. You get this swelling or puffiness. And then cretinism is a specific disorder for childhood hypothyroidism. If you're born genetically not able to make enough thyroid hormone, what do you know is going to happen to your metabolism? It goes down. Remember, we had effects that stimulate the development of the brain. So if somebody doesn't have the thyroid, they're not going to stimulate the development of the brain. What clinical symptom are they going to have? Mental retardation. Yeah. And I believe there's a picture. Oh, sorry. This is an example of mix, mixidema, puffiness. So it's the puffiness around the eyes in this situation. Actually, puffiness everywhere. And then here's cretinism. So a lot of times their tongues kind of protrude, they're a little bit thicker. And here's a child with cretinism, child that without. So a little bit thicker in weight. His face, again, is a little bit puffy around here. And if you were to put him through a mental exam, what would you find out about him? His IQ is probably lower than normal. Yeah. Okay, next. Hyperthyroidism. What's wrong with them? They make way too much. So one of the causes is a tumor. Ten, uh, tumors have a tendency to increase production. Tumors are causing things to rapidly reproduce and rapidly be active. So if it's, a, if it's an actual thyroid cell, a follicular cell that's tumor causing, it's probably going to cause more and more thyroid hormone to be released. What should happen to their metabolism? Yeah, to an extent, it goes up, and what's going to happen to their weight? It goes down. What's going to happen to their m mental stability? I giggle because I know somebody that has it, but she's super anxious, always anxious. She's always on the edge of her seat. She's just really s sensitive or touchy. Don't make me scare you again. We talked about this last week. <laughs> Right. And then the most common form of hyperthyroidism is Graves' disease. Graves' disease is autoimmune. Your body actually makes little antibodies that attack your thyroid. But they don't attack to destroy the thyroid. They attack the receptors that are usually stimulated by TSH. So if they act like TSH, what are they going to do to the thyroid? They stimulate it. They look just like TSH, and they call them TSIs, thyroid-stimulating immunoglobulins, which are antibodies. They go to the thyroid, they plug into that, that key, or that lock, and they act like the key, and they turn on the lock, and they make you crank up your prediction of T3 and T4. It's Graves' disease. And one of the symptoms, exothalamus. Oops, I thought the picture was here. There we go. So there's exothalamus. The eyes start protruding out. They kind of bug out a little bit. What's happening is they build up proteins behind the eyes and it's pushing the eyes forward. Unfortunately, what's it doing? What could that cause? Huh? Blindness. Why blindness? Or vision loss? Because when you're pushing the eyes forward, what are you pulling on? <coughs> the optic nerve. You're tugging on the optic nerve and it's really sensitive to stretch. So it can cause blindness. Um, when it gets far enough out, their eyelids can't close completely. So what's going to happen to the cornea? It's going to start drying out. And then this is just a natural appearance. There was an actor back in the 70s, Marty Feldman. Anybody know who I'm talking about? Yeah. 
from Young Frankenstein. Yeah. But actually, it was in a lot of them. That's getting really annoying. Just saying. You might want to tell her later. I think she doesn't care. I think you're right. She does that in every class. Oh, really? Okay. Do me a favor. Don't bring your boyfriend to, to class with you. <laughs> and then stand up and walk around in class and then leave. Okay. So a goiter. Where's the goiter happening at? It happens in the throat. It's the thyroid enlarging. Think of it this way. If you had a business and you had a large demand to make a lot of stuff, tons and tons of material, what are you going to have to do to your business or your factory? You're going to have to make it bigger. When you overstimulate the thyroid with something like TSI, that thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin, your immune system's cranking out demand for thyroid hormone and it's making this thyroid do what? Get bigger and bigger and bigger to meet the demand so it can start growing out. Goiter is interesting because it can happen because of too much thyroid stimulating hormone or too much TSI, but it can also happen if you're missing one important element to make thyroid stim or thyroid hormone. What do you have to have? What's a raw material? A mineral? Iodine. iodine. So if you're lacking iodine, that can also do it. A goiter is tricky because in this situation, was this hyper or hypothyroidism? Hypo That's TSH. having too much TSH and TSI is going to do what to the thyroid? Hyper, hyperproduce. But if you don't have iodine, can you make thyroid hormone? So what are you going to have? Hypo or hyper? Hypo. So a goiter can actually happen in both situations. It's a tricky problem. Wait, why would it enlarge if it's hypo? Ooh, good, a good question. What if you had that same business and you kept putting, let's say you made cars, and you kept putting all the raw materials into the cars. However, you couldn't get products to make the tires. Are the cars ever going to leave? Nope, you're going to take all the other materials and you keep building them more and more. So your warehouse is going to have to do what? Get bigger to store all those parts, right? So it's going to have to get bigger until you actually get the raw materials to finish the car. There's a goiter. So, yeah, it's kind of large. And you don't see a lot of goiters in the United States because we add iodine to what as part of the law? Or it used to be part of the law. Yeah, we used to have to add it to salt, so if you bought any salt in the stores, but nowadays with health food stores, you can buy natural sea salt that doesn't have iodine added to it. And then there's just a small starter. That's a starter goiter. <laughs> right, next gland, the adrenal glands. Where do they sit? Top of the kidneys. What do you call the outer edge of the adrenal glands? The cortex. What do you call the gooey center? The medulla. And when you look at the different layers, you have to be familiar with the layers. And I think in your notes, I actually have it. Sure, I do. Down at the bottom of page 142, you know that the uh, anatomy sits on top of the kidney. And it's actually only about the size of your thumb, like the tip of your thumb. It's not huge. So it's about three or four centimeters across. And the med medulla and then the cortex. And the cortex is the main producer of the hormones. And where I'm going at with this next part, where it says zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, and zona reticularis, put a number one by the glomerulosa, a number two by the fasciculata, and a number three by the reticularis. The reason I'm having you doing, do that is because number one there is associated with the hormone number one just below it. Can you say that again? Yep. The zona glomerulosa, which you just put a number one by, if you look just below, it says adrenal steroids, blah, blah, blah. Number one, mineral corticoids, they're made in the glomerulosa. The number two, the fasciculata, makes number two the glucocorticoids. Number three, the reticularis, makes the number three sex hormones. So they match up. I think that's all I have there. Yeah. Okay. And then you want to remember these different sections. When I look at these three, and I'm going to tell you a way that I memorized it, make your own creative way to memorize things, and it's, it'll be a lot more original for you. But... When I look at the layers of the cortex, I think of the, the outside as being the hardest, most, most firm part. So I always think of like stones and minerals. So this outer layer is going to make a what kind of a, look at down below, a what kind of corticoid? <laughs> a mineral, right? In fact, this mineral corticoid, the, the hormone that's released is called aldosterone, which sounds like the word stone, right? 
So I just associate those. It's the hardest outside part. It's like stone solid made out of minerals. It's mineral corticoids, aldosterone, the outer layer. What is the mineral that aldosterone is regulating? A little more specific. Sodium, sodium right. It's regulating sodium. <laughs> I was just hanging on it, hanging on it, waiting for somebody to hit the regular sodium. But Yep, so it's regulating the sodium. And you already know that pathway. What's the name of the pathway that regulates that chemical? The RAAS, right? Renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Next layer, the zona fasciculata. This is a glucocorticoid. So I always think glucose like sugar. And sugar looks kind of like rocks, right? You can, but if you put it between your fingers and you start twisting, what's it do? It crumbles and powders. So is it as strong as the minerals? It's a little softer. We're getting closer to the gooey center. So the outside was the minerals. The next one down are the glucose, the sugar regulators. And that hormone is cortisol. And you have to remember cortisol. What did I call cortisol before? The stress hormone. So when cortisol comes out, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes, it's going to help regulate your blood sugars. What organ is depending on that blood sugar in a stressful situation? The brain. The brain. Yep, so the brain's going to help, or it's going to help the brain by boosting up your blood sugars so that you can think quickly and get out of that stressful situation. Right. What's the name of the hormone that stimulates the release of cortisol now that you've done your feedback loops? ACTH, right. So always think of the pathways. And the next one, zona reticularis. This would be the softest one. And I think soft, I always think of my pillow, and then I always think of sex hormones. <laughs> so back when I was learning this stuff, there was a song on the radio called Sex and Candy. Isn't that what it was called? So I think gluco and then sex right after it. So I guess technically it should be candy and sex. I don't know what that means. All right. But this, do you remember the, th the four little letters that I told you were that sex hormone? I said you'd never have to remember that long name, but you need to remember the four letters. D-H-E-A. Dihydroxyepiandosterone, which you don't have to remember the long words. You just rem remember D-H-E-A. Do you remember what I told you it did? Did it feminize or masculinize you? Masculinizing. Masculinizing. Who has it, men or women? Both. Both. In women, it increases the sex drives and makes them think like a man, right? Because that's what we think about all the time. In men, we don't need this so much because we have what? Testosterone. Testosterone. So this is the weaker of the two <laughs> masculinizing hormones. But women have a little bit of testosterone. A little bit. But this DHEA is going to be the, more, the bigger driver. Mm -hmm. And then the pathway that stimulates this is the same pathway that stimulates cortisol, which is what pathway? What hormone? ACTH. So it turns on both of them at the same time. And sometimes you have to remember that. If it's more than one hormone that's stimulated, if I'm not making enough of one hormone, what's going to happen to the other hormone? It's going to keep getting made more and more and more until I catch up with the other one. And I kind of gave you that idea with testosterone and, and sperm production. What are the two hormones that regulate testosterone and sperm production? FSH and LH. Which one does sperm? FSH. FSH, because it looks like fish to me, so I always think that. So LH re regulates testosterone, and then um, FSH regulates sperm production. But if you don't have enough testosterone, let's say you have something broken with your testosterone maker, the testes. <coughs> your testes are broken, which seems really weird or awkward to say. That guy has a broken testis. <laughs> but what's the hypothalamus going to think if you're not making enough testosterone? It's going to say, turn up the release of LH and FSH. Is LH going to make much of a difference? Nope. But FSH is going to do what to his cells that are making sperm? It's going to try and stimulate them. OK, so think about the pathways. And then when you look at the different layers, another way I remember the layers from outer to inner is GFR. Have you ever heard those three initials before? Yes. Yeah, I always think of like glomerular filtration right? since it's over the kidney. So there's no physical significance to it, but I just remember those three in order as GFR, because I already knew the initials. So glomerulosa, fasciculata, and the reticularis. Those are the cortex. The other thing you want to write down about all of these hormones, every hormone up here is made from the same starting material. Do you know what it is? Think sex hormone. 
It started as raw material. You're, you're right with the pathway, but what do you need to make these? Is it going to be a peptide protein? Is it going to be an amine or is it going to be a steroid? It's a steroid. What are they all made out of? All steroids are made out of cholesterol. All three of these layers use cholesterol. The only difference between the three layers is the enzyme. So the enzyme, one enzyme takes it and turns it into aldosterone. Another enzyme takes it and turns it into DHA. And the third <coughs> enzyme takes it and turns it into cortisol. So all of these hormones are made from steroid or from cholesterol. They're all steroids. And then the last layer, the center layer, that's going to be the medulla. And the medulla doesn't use cholesterol. The medulla starts with a raw material called tyrosine. What's it going to make? You know it's not going to make thyroid hormone because this isn't the thyroid anymore, so it has to make catecholamines. Yep. So dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. And I already talked about that. Synthesis, cortisol. I didn't talk about this part, though. All three of those, are they lipid-loving or water-loving if they're made from, from steroid or from cholesterol? They're all lipid-loving. Do they want to flow through the wa water in the blood easily? Nope. So what do they have to have? A floaty device. Right. So they have to have a carrier protein. Proteins love water. So these proteins come cruising along, and then the, the fat-loving hormone binds to the protein. So the name of the hormone, hormone and protein binding group, you have aldosterone binding to albumin. You've heard this before, right? What do I always compare albumin in your blood to? It's like the egg white, right? So this albumin is floating through your blood, helping you retain water in your blood, but its second purpose is to help carry aldosterone. And then cortisol uses something called transcortin, which is the transport form of cortisol. And then DHEA, the sex hormone, same thing. Binds to al albumin. So if you wanted, you could write one, two, and three by those two, and then you have that whole pattern. All the ones match up, and all the twos match up, and all the threes match up. And then how you break these things apart. So these are sex hormones. Are they going to stick around for a while? They're made out of what? Cholesterol, which means are they water-loving? Nope. They hate water. Are they going to get broken down quickly? Nope. Are they going to work quickly? Nope. So when you degrade them, what two organs are going to help process them? <coughs> the kidney and the liver. And when the liver breaks them down, it will actually break them down into a more water-loving form and then put them out in what? Where's the liver usually push things to? <coughs> Pushes them out towards the feces. And then where's the kidney going to push them out at? Yeah. Into the urine. Okay. And then the physiological effects of each of them. So adrenal androgens, that would be... What? Masculinizing. So if it's adrenal androgen, it's not testosterone here, it's DHEA. Mm. So the physiological effects of androgens or estrogens, what are they going to do? What, do? what do these sex hormones do to you other than affect your sex drive? What are they going to do to you during puberty when they crank out? Make you look more like the sex you were determined to be. So what's it going to do to a man? What's this androgen going to do to a man? More muscle mass. More muscle mass? What's it going to do to his voice? Deepen, Deepen the voice. What about body hair? It's going to put hair on his chest, right? <laughs> so I was told ketchup does that. I avoided ketchup and it didn't work. Huh? Potato, Pot potato skins? Potato skins? Don't eat those. Yeah. So many wives' tales. <laughs> But anyway, it's going to cause pubic and axillary hair growth. What's axillary mean? Armpit. Yep. So it's going to spur on that growth spurt. Where's it going to go other than muscles? What other thing is going to sp The bone, right. What's the name of that plate or line? The epiphyseal plate, right? And then development and maintenance of the female sex drive. So for females, what's, what do men have to develop that sex drive? We have testosterone, right? And then remember, it's the pathway. It's a CRH, which came from where? Hypothalamus, ACTH that came from anterior pituitary, and then it goes down to the cortex and stimulates the release of DHEA. What's the other hormone that it stimulates the release of? Cortisol. Cortisol. Yep. So which is true about the adrenal sex hormones?
How about number four? Adrenal sex hormones are hydrophilic. Yeah. Why? They're made out of cholesterol. They're steroids, so that's definitely false. How about males make androgens and females make the estrogens? Do women make androgens? They do. In fact, we just talked about one. Well, what is it? DHA. DHA. So you can cross that one out. So it's got to be number two or number three. Do you think sex hormones are essential for life? Only if you're a man would you think that, right? So no, they're not essential for life. They just increase secondary sex characteristics and sex drive. But what about number two? CRH, ACTH pathway stimulates the production of those adrenal sex hormones. That one's true. Number two is true. So it's not essential for life, but it makes life worth living. All right, mineral corticoids and aldosterone. So you already know the pathway, right? It's called the RAAS. To a very, very minor extent does the ACTH pathway, but so insignificant we're not even going to worry about it. I'm just saying that your book may mention it a little bit, and other textbooks in the future may talk about it a little bit. But the main driving regulator for aldosterone is the RAAS, renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And then we've said this before, but aldosterone is absolutely necessary for life. If you lose all the sodium in your body, your neurons won't fire properly, your muscles won't contract properly, and you will die. Is there a nicer way to say that? Okay, so absolutely essential for life. Where do they work? <coughs> Aldosterone works on the kidney to make you re retain sodium. Yep. So we don't have to spend much time on there, but what's true about aldosterone? What do you already know? How about number three, true or false? Absolutely true. All the cortical hormones, or adrenal cortical hormones, are made from cholesterol, all of them. So number three, dang it, is true. <laughs> Damn, I went right for the right one. Okay, so how about number one? It's regulated by the ACTH pathway. It's regulated by what pathway? RAAS. How about aldosterone's a vasoconstrictor? What other A word was a vasoconstrictor? A DH, which is also known as vasopressin, right? And then aldosterone functions by secreting sodium into the urine. Why is that wrong? Does anything secrete sodium into the urine? No. no. Right. And then the glucocorticoids, cortisol, and this is the one that has the most material. So it controls intermediate metabolism. Um, in other words, it regulates things like fat, protein, and carb metabolism. So these are the physiological effects. These are the things that cortisol causes as a final outcome. So if you're drawing the boxes in the pathway, when you get all the way to the bottom and you're talking about cortisol, here are the effects. First, hepatic gluconeogenesis. Whew, huge. Break it down. What's hepatic mean? The liver is doing something. Read this word backwards. Genesis means the creation. Neo means new, of new, and then sugar, glucose. So the liver makes brand new sugars. Where's it going to push that sugar? Into the blood. Why is it pushing sugar into the blood? Cortisol is a stress hormone. Why is it pushing sugar into the blood? To get to the brain to help your brain do what? Think faster, right? To get you out of that bad situation. And then inhibits glucose uptake and use by many cells but not the brain. So in other words, cortisol is looking out for the brain. It's saying screw everything else but the brain, so it's actually going to stop, it's going to block you from reabsorbing sugar. What hormone is it opposing then? Insulin. It's working against insulin. So if you're in a high-stress situation, you're cranking out your cortisol, what might it look like you have? It's making your insulin not work properly, so you might look like you have diabetes. diabetes. Right. It's raising your blood sugar. It may make sugar appear in your urine. It's making you seem a little bit hyperactive. Right. Facilitates lipolysis. What's that saying? Breaking apart. Fats. Where's it breaking fat from then? Where do you store fat? In your adipose tissue. So it's trying to help you break down fats. This is an interesting one. It does it to a certain extent. So it'll help you break down fats at first so that you have quick energy. But the problem is it blocks you from storing fat in your normal fat stores. 
Anybody know the name of the disorder if you make too much cortisol? Cushing's. Cushing's. Have you ever seen those people? They get really, really fat faces. Normally you don't normally you don't store a lot of fat in your face, but with Cushing's syndrome they store a bunch of fat in their face and they call it moon face because they get a really round face. That's not a normal place. But if you look at their arms and their legs, do they look big and fat? They look scrawny. So I'll show you some pictures in just a little bit. So it stimulates lipolysis or lipolysis from normal fat stores, from the love handles, from the butt cheeks, from the thighs. And then the last one stimulates protein degradation. Where do you store protein in your body? Muscles. In the muscles. So what's it going to do to your muscles? It's breaking them apart. So all three things, sugars, fats, and, and uh, proteins, it does what to all three of those? Breaks them down to put them where? Put them all in the blood. It's giving you quick energy to get out of a bad situation. The next thing you want to know, permissive action. So cortisol has to be present in, in enough for the catechol means to actually work properly. This is why lack of cortisol can be life-threatening. Because if you don't have enough cortisol, but you have epinephrine in your system, what's it going to... Are you going to be able to constrict blood vessels? It's saying it's permissive for epinephrine, so will epinephrine be able to constrict blood vessels properly? No, if you can't constrict your blood vessels, what happens to your blood pressure? It plummets, right? Is that a bad thing? Yeah, what if you have really low blood pressure and you try to stand up, what's going to happen to you? It's going to race, the blood's going to race to your feet, and what's going to happen to you? You're going to pass out. If you can't push blood up to your brain, what's going to happen to you? Eventually, you're going to die. So is cortisol necessary for life? Yes. Yep. Was aldosterone necessary for life? Yes. yes. Was DHEA necessary for life? No. no. So is that Addison's disease then? Addison's is affecting cortisol and aldosterone. Yep. And we'll talk about Addison's too. Right. And the next one, roll, roll in adaptation to stress. We already talked about this. It's breaking down all of your nutrient stores and putting them into the blood so you have quick energy. Turns up the responsiveness of blood vessels. So in other words, if you have cortisol, what's epinephrine going to do? Respond less or respond more? Responds more. It's going to be more responsive. So now you're basically you're priming the blood vessels. A little bit of epinephrine, change in your blood pressure. Why would it change your blood pressure fast? What's it trying to do? It's trying to push blood where? To the brain. Here's a nasty little side effect. It decreases the number of asonophils and basophils in the blood. What are those things? Those are white blood cells. And then increase the number of neutrophils. So it cranks up the number of neutrophils in your blood. But the problem is it blocks them from moving into the tissue. So yay, they're in your blood. But what happens if you get an infection in the tissue? It decreases your immune response. So why do people take artificial cortisol? To suppress the immune system. To either suppress the immune system or to suppress what response it's associated with immune? Inflammation. Inflammation. Yep. So when you take artificial cortisol, usually it's called prednisone or hydrocortisone. Okay. And then anti-inflammatory, oh, sorry, I skipped over. Red, it uh, also increases the number of red blood cells. Is that a good or a bad thing? It's good to an extent because what's it going to help you do? Carry more oxygen. The bad thing is what's it going to do to the thickness of the blood? Increase it, which is going to cause problems for what organ? The heart. the heart. More work on the heart. And then it increases platelets in the blood, which makes you prepped for what? Clotting. Clotting. If you're an, evolutionarily, cortisol was good because if you had a stress response, it's because something was about to eat you. So you were cranking up sugar to your brain. You're trying to respond quickly. You're trying to get out of this bad situation. Run for your life. And if that thing got a hold of you and cut you, now you have increased platelets. What's going to happen faster? You're going to clot that faster to save your life. But nowadays, stress comes because you're sitting at a computer, you're doing homework for your physiology class. God, I hate that. And you're just getting stressed out about money or relationships or whatever. These are all psychological stressors that are cranking up your cortisol. So a little bit different nowadays. So in other words, that stress is killing you. What's it doing to your immune system? 
turning it down? What's it doing to your blood sugars? Cranking them up, what's it doing to your ability to maintain healthy muscle mass? Turning it down. What's it going to do to your regular fat stores? Lose them, right? On an upside, but too much is a bad thing. I'll show you in just a few slides. Right? So here, anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressive effects. So you need to know the good and the bad things about cortisol. If you're taking artificial cortisol prednisone for a long time, what do you think is going to happen to your cortisol-making factories? They're going to start slowing down. What's going to happen to your adrenal gland? It's going to start shrinking. Is cortisol important for life? So if you went off of prednisone really quick or artificial cortisol really quick, could that be dangerous? It could be very dangerous. Yet, why do they tell you when you're coming off of it? They tell you to taper off slowly back off of it so that it gives your, chan your body a chance to do what? Start making its own so it can catch up on its own again. It's why they tell you like at, over the last four or five days or three or four days, do half and then half and then half. This is a steroid hormone. This is a fat-loving hormone. Is it made quickly? No, it takes time to be made too. Yep, and that's why they tell you to taper off. So your cortisol regulation, you already knew this. CRH from the hypothalamus, ACTH from the anterior pituitary. This is kind of a fun one too. This ACTH, when it's made, it's actually made from something called pro opio melano cortin. What's pro telling you? It's inactive, right? It's before, it's inactive. But it's made of three, when you split this thing up and you make it active, it makes three different hormones. One, the cortin part is ACTH. The second one is a melanocyte stimulating hormone. What's it stimulating? Pigment cells. Pigment cells. So when you're in a stressful situation and you're making lots of ACTH, what's going to do to the pigment in your skin? Start darkening it. Yeah. And then opio sounds like opioid or opiates. What's that going to do? Suppress pain. So evolutionarily, this was a good thing. I don't still don't understand the melanocytes. Maybe it's to help camouflage you with a dark environment. I have no clue. <laughs> but with this one, it's turning up the cortisol to help you deal with the stress. The opiates, in case you do get attacked in that stressful situation, what's it helping you do? Deal with the pain to get your butt out of the bad situation, right? So it's kind of an interesting pathway. If you shut off cortisol, what's it going to do to this pathway? If you can't make cortisol... What's the hypothalamus going to think if you can't make cortisol? Turn up higher. So it's going to start making these other components too. It's going to make more ACTH, which is going to make you release more, not cortisol, because you can't make cortisol. It's going to make you release more, what was the other hormone? DHEA. It makes you make more DHEA. So what's that going to do to you? Make you more masculine, right? <laughs> Secondary sex characters are going to start coming out if you can't make enough cortisol. It's going to start releasing more of these pain suppressing stimulants and it's going to make your skin look darker. And that's all part of Addison's disease, which we'll talk about. Okay, cortisol regulation is also diurnal, which means day and night. When's it highest? Do you remember? In the morning. In the morning when you wake up. So when's the best time to deal with stress? In the morning when you wake up. Not doing your homework at 1 o'clock the night before it's due. And then, of course, stress causes it to come out. So the long loop negative feedback, of course you know this pathway, cortisol, low cortisol turns it on, night, day cycles turns it on, and stress turns it on. So if you're on artificial cortisol for a long time, <coughs> would your, would the, would your thyroid, um, if you're on high cortisol, atrophy? your hypothalamus won't atrophy. Yeah. Because your hypothalamus is making way too many things. It's too busy all the time. But what would atrophy? The adrenal gland. Yep. So if you turn down this pathway, it's going to turn down your ability to make cortisol and DHEA. So it turns down both. And then at some point, would it not be able to recover? Mm, I can't think of when it would never be able to recover. Uh, if you slowly... Atrophy wouldn't, like, be permanent. Yeah, the atrophy's not going to kill it. It just sh shrinks down the cells. Oh, okay. Yep. If you don't have to use something, they minimize. Instead of dying off, they just minimize to re save resources. And then here's how the book puts it together. All right, so which one's true about cortisol? Cortisol's made from tyrosine, yes or no? No, what's it made from? Cholesterol. How about cortisol causes increased fat and protein synthesis? What does synthesis mean? 
making. Making. So does it make you f no. add adipose tissue and add big muscles? No. no, it does just the opposite. So number two is false. How about number three? Cortisol is bound to a protein in the blood. Yes. Why is that? Because it is a lipid loving hormone, right? It can't travel easily through the blood, so it needs to bind. So number three is the right answer. How about number four? Cortisol is highest before you fall asleep. No way. Okay, so some of the fun things that break. And first one, aldosterone hypersecretion. So aldosterone, too much aldosterone is going to make you do what? What does aldosterone do? Retain sodium. So it's going to make you do what? Retain way too much sodium. And what's going to follow the sodium? Water. What's going to happen to you? You're going to swell up like the Michelin man, right? So you start swelling up with con syndrome. Too much sodium in your blood is going to start screwing with your neurons. It's going to create an imbalance. If you have too much salt in your blood and your interstitial fluid, when the neurons are using that salt, there's way too much. So aldosterone hypersecretion called con syndrome. What's that going to do to the hypothalamus if you're making way too much aldosterone? Is it going to make you thirsty all the time? Heck yeah. If you're making lots of aldosterone, you're retaining lots of salt, think about eating a bag full of pretzels. How's it going to make you feel? Dehydrated and thirsty. You're going to start drinking lots and lots of water. How about cortisol? Whoops. Cortisol hypersecretion. What would that do to your blood sugar? Spike it. It would spike it. That disease is called Cushing syndrome. And they used to also refer to it as pseudo pseudo diabetes or adrenal cortical diabetes. Why? It makes their blood sugars go up. It makes them start peeing out a lot of sugary urine. Yep. So it looks a lot like diabetes. But what's not what what isn't wrong with them? What hormones associated with diabetes? Insulin. There's nothing wrong with their insulin. This is all about Yep, all about cortisol. Okay. And then Cushing syndrome, I have a couple pictures on the next several slides. There's an example with the moon face. So this guy his face is really big, but when you look at their bodies, their arms and legs are usually scrawny compared to the rest of the body. He doesn't save a lot of fat in his love handles like a typical man does. He saves it straight out. So that Dunlop syndrome with the belly Dunlop over the belt <laughs> is happening. But normal fat stores like the tush and the thighs, thin. What about his muscle mass? Does he look like he has really muscular legs? No, really muscular arms? And they look like there's a little extra skin there, but that's about it. Right, there's another example. So this guy, look at his face first. He looks like Fred Flintstone, number one. And his face is really round. But look at his arms. Look at his legs. Look at the stretch marks. So anybody know the name of the stuff that's in your skin that helps it to stretch and gives it stability? It starts with a C. Collagen. What's it made out of? Proteins. What is cortisol doing to the proteins in your body? Helping you build them or breaking them all apart? Breaking them all apart. So. The reason they get these stretch marks is you have to think their belly is stretching straight out because they're storing this abdo or this fat in a weird place. So they can't store it in normal fat storage places, but everywhere it does store it, that skin's stretching. If you don't have the free proteins to build it, can you build new skin to accommodate to the stretch? Nope. So they start getting these stretch marks. Strye. Here's a kid before and after. Looks like Charlie Sheen. <laughs> Okay, and the next one, adrenal androgen hypersecretion, also known as adrenogenital syndrome. So, they're releasing, when I say adrenal androgen, what are they releasing too much of? DHEA. Way too much DHEA. What would that do to a little girl? Just think about it. It would make her more masculine, right? What would it do to a little boy? Do boys normally have high testosterone before puberty? No, no their testosterone is like almost next to nothing. So are they used to having a lot of masculinizing hormone? What's going to happen to them if a sex or masculine hormone comes out too early? They're going to start looking like, like a man, right? So they're going to start looking like they're going from boy to man really quick. What's it going to do to an adult male having DHEA? Make him a stud, right? But DHEA is insignificant compared to what? Testosterone. So you usually don't see a lot of effects in an adult male. Maybe a little bit 
more hair growth or a little bit more aggression. Right? So adult females, if it's a woman, does it make any difference if she's an adult and has two inch DHEA? One thing is it's going to turn up her sex drive, but the other thing is it's going to give her more masculine characteristics like a beard, yeah, facial hair. And that's called hirsutism. Like the bearded lady where she has a lot of facial hair. Anywhere that's androgen sensitive, like anywhere that a man grows hair that women normally don't, starts sprouting hair. So they can get chest hair, they can get facial hair, they can get back hair. Awesome, huh? Yeah. I'm sure that's what everyone in here is thinking. <laughs> and every man's going, thank God, now I don't have to buy my own razors, I'll just use hers. And then, oh. newborn females, huh? You're thinking, that's brilliant, isn't it? Yeah, saving, saving a couple bucks a week there. So, <laughs> newborn females, it causes something called female pseudo. What does pseudo mean? False. False. So, pseudo hermaphroditism. Hermaphroditism means having both sex organs. This is false. What happens is that she has a vagina. But the clitoris, and we'll talk about this next week again too, the clitoris starts over-expanding so it looks like a what? Like a penis. So it looks like she's a boy, but she actually has a vagina underneath the penis. Does she have ovaries then? Yeah. yeah. She's, she is sexually, she is a female. She has the XX. So she has ovaries, uterus, but unfortunately she has too much of this masculinizing hormone so it makes her look more masculine. So, in females. Um, and then pre-puberty in boys. Pre-puberty is not puberty. In fact, it's called precocious pseudo-puberty. What's it mean? It's a false puberty. What happens is they start looking more like a man. They go through a growth spurt before normal puberty. So they start sprouting up really tall because of that extra sex hormone. They start growing facial hair. They start growing armpit hair, pubic hair. Unfortunately, this DHEA does nothing to sperm production. So what do you still know about them? They're still infertile. Yeah, they can't. They look like an adult man, but they're incapable of reproducing still until they go through real puberty. And then in adult males, really, there's minimal characteristics. So here's some, whoops. Here's kind of a review slide of what happens to an adult female. Deepens her voice, makes her arms and legs more muscular, shrinks her breasts. Basically, it turns down her femi feminine characteristics and starts turning up masculine ones. Okay. Menstruation might stop. St or stop. <coughs> And then we talked about female infants, boys, and then adult men. <coughs> and then there's the pathway. So with that sex hormone cranking out here, you're going to start screwing with the whole pathway that revolves around ACTH and CRH. That's a girl. Looks like a wrestler when I was in high school, doesn't it? So, but it's a girl. Too much sex hormone, so she looks more like a boy. And that's, I think it's a 10-year-old boy. So his hands, his arms, his legs, everything's getting bigger. I think I'll just lock, leave it there, right? <laughs> I swear it was a picture that came with the book. All right, and then adrenal cortical insufficiency, Addison's disease. So adrenal cortical insufficiency, what hormone are we going to start talking about? Actually, what two hormones are we going to start talking about? Cortisol and aldosterone. So with Addison's, the main one you're really concerned with is aldosterone. <laughs> because aldosterone has a faster effect on life or death situations. The key here is if you're insufficient in one, when we talk about Cushing's, you had too much. All it takes is one gland to turn up. But in Addison's, if you, if you break one gland, why is it okay at first? You have a backup. You have a spare. The other one will start picking up, like the kidneys. If you lose one kidney, the other kidney kicks in a little bit harder. In this situation with the adrenal glands, if one adrenal gland isn't working properly, the other one kicks in. So to get true Addison's disease, both adrenal glands have to decrease their ability to make aldosterone and cortisol. Right. And then with primary adrenal cortisol, what's it saying when it says primary? What do, we, what do you mean by that? It's the adrenal gland specifically. So all layers of the adrenal cortex are under secreting. Okay, and then secondary means a tropic. What's a tropic hormone? It's a hormone that stimulates the release of a second hormone. So what hormone could be broken here? ACTH or CRH could be broken. Oops, let's go back one more. So if you're not making cortisol 
in aldosterone, what's the hypothalamus think? If you're not making cortisol, what's the hypothalamus think? Turn up, right? So it makes more CRH and it goes to the anterior pituitary and makes more ACTH. Is it helping? No. Nope. And when you make more ACTH, you make more of that melanocortin or melanocortin, <coughs> that mel melan melanin secreting hormone, and you also make more of the opiate hormone. What's going to happen to your skin with Addison's? It starts getting darker. So they actually had this like beautiful tan looking skin. There's always like a good side to a disease, like weight loss, fresh looking skin, looking beautiful and tanned. There's always that nasty death side effect though that really deters me from wanting to get any of them. All right, next structure, the medulla, down in the center. And what did I tell you is being secreted? What? They start with a C. Something means Catecholamines, right. So things like epinephrine and norepinephrine. So with the anatomy, what page are we on? I totally lost track of the notes. I get so talk, excited about talking about the diseases. We're on what? Wow, look how much progress we're making. So you know the anatomy, you know where it's at. It's in the middle of the adrenal gland. What's it made from? Tyrosine. So what class does it fall into? Peptide proteins, amines, or the steroid hormones? It's the amines. Is it water-loving or water-fearing? It's water-loving. So does it work quickly or slowly? It works quickly. Where does it work on its target cell? Inside the cell or on the outside? On the outside, right? So you already know those things and always keep thinking back to them over and over again. The name of the cells that make them and store them, remember they're made as a large protein, shrunk down to a smaller one, and then finally released as the active form. They're stored in these things called chromaffin cells or chromaffin granule cells. And then stimulate the secretion. This is a special pathway. This is a neural connection. Your brain sends a neuron all the way down your spinal cord, out to the thoracolumbar system. What part of the nervous system am I talking about when I say the thoracolumbar? The sympathetic nervous system. So sympathetic nervous system sends a signal all the way down to the adrenal medulla and tells it to release what? Every time you think sympathetic nervous system, what should you think? Epinephrine or adrenaline, right? So this is a neural pathway. I scare the heck out of you. I chase you with a baseball bat. I sick my pet bear on you. I do any of those things. Your brain goes, holy crap, sends a signal down and makes you release adrenaline. How are you going to feel? Like you're about to run for your life or fight for your life, right? So you're, already, you're familiar with the pathway. I just wanted to remind you. It works just like a neuron. So you send the stimuli all the way on through the axons. You release that epinephrine, norepinephrine from a modified neuron, the adrenal medulla. So you save it up just like neurotransmitters and then dump it into the blood. Once it's in the blood, where does it go? Everywhere. And then there are those four little, what are these things? Alphas and betas, alpha one, alpha two, beta one, beta two. What are they collectively? They're called? Receptors. What kind of receptors? Do you remember? Isn't that for pain? No. Um, adrenergic receptors, right. So these are those adrenaline receptors, adrenergic receptors again. We saw them at the end of, uh, which one was that? Nervous system. Very end of the nervous system, beginning of the muscle. So alpha 1, alpha 2, beta 1, beta 2. Epinephrine, nor norepinephrine. Which one works on all of these? Epinephrine. Why? Because it's because you said so, right? Thank you, God. Because norepinephrine's like this. Remember my example, and epinephrine's like that. Which one can fit in all of the locks? The bigger one or the smaller one? The smaller one. Epinephrine is just modified norepinephrine. It's cleaved just a little bit, so it's smaller. So remember, epinephrine binds to all of them. It has its greatest affinity to these beta 2s. But norepinephrine will bind to everything but the beta 2. And then we talked about those all before. OK, so what epinephrine does, or norepinephrine does, it has metabolic effects. So what's it do to your metabolism? Take a guess. It increases your metabolism. Why? You're breaking down things to release it into the blood so that you have energy. quick energy. So the first thing you want to look at is its effect on sugar. It causes that 
gluconeogenesis tells the liver start making sugar because we're about to run for our life. This is a nasty little thing though. You start taking amino acids and you turn them to glucose. It's an unnatural process. What do you what would you prefer to turn into glucose? What's the storage form of glucose? Glycogen. If you can take glycogen, store glycogen, turn it to glucose, it's easy, it's fast, and it doesn't have any nasty side effects. When you take amino acids and turn them to glucose, do you remember that nasty side product you make? Ketones, Ketones right? So you start making these ketone bodies or ketone acids, right? Which causes your blood to become acidic. So it's better to use the sugar and use the amino acids as a backup plan. Okay, and then other effects promote a quick state of arousal, increased thinking, quick thinking. So, what other hormones is this going to work really well with? Cortisol. All right, so which is true? No such thing as a guess, it's instinct. So, which is true about the adrenal medulla? How about number four? Adrenal medulla hormones cause your heart rate to decrease. No. Way wrong. If there's some pathomimetic, what do they do to you? Yep, what's it do to your blood pressure? Take it up. So number four is totally wrong. Number three, the adrenal medulla hormones are steroids. False. They're made out of tyrosine. What class are they? They're the amines. How about number two? The adrenal medulla hormones are essential for life. You ever heard of anybody with adrenal exhaustion? It's a disease. Did they die? No. How do they feel though? How would you feel if you had adrenal exhaustion? I'm tired all the time. You're just like, ugh, oh, leave me alone. I just want to take a nap. So you can live without it. Number one, the adrenal medulla releases primarily epinephrine. True. To a lesser extent, it releases norepinephrine. So its primary hormone is epinephrine, but to a lesser extent, norepinephrine. And then the disease, this is really rare. It's called theochromocytoma. What's a toma? It's a tumor, right? So pheochromocytoma is a tumor, and it's of those chromato or chromaffin cells. So it's of the chromaffin cells. And remember, the chromaffin cells are the ones that are storing the adrenaline. So if there's a tumor in it, they overactivate, they overrelease. How are these people going to feel? They're going to be wired all the time, right? It's like that movie Crank, so constantly going. Okay, so we've talked about cortisol, we've talked about norepinephrine, and in general, the stress response involves both epinephrine and cortisol. So, of course, you know the sympathetic nervous system, when you're feeling stressed, it's going to help you deal with the stress. So it releases epinephrine to help you pop up your blood sugars, to help you stimulate your thinking, to help you run for your life and get out of a bad situation. Uh, increases CO and ventilation suppresses. It should be increases what? Just missing a number. Yeah, CO2. What's CO? Carbon monoxide. It increases your carbon dioxide and ventilation. And then it suppresses digestion in the kidney. There should be a comma after ventilation. Look at the typos. It's a good thing you didn't stand up and leave class, huh? I'm not bitter or anything. All right, and then roles of CRH, ACTH, cortisol system and stress. Of course, you know this pathway. It's going to do what to cortisol? Cranks out cortisol. What's cortisol going to do? Increase your metabolism. It's going to increase your fat breakdown for energy. It's going to increase your what levels in your blood? Sugar, fats, and amino acids. The fun thing is to an extent, it facilitates learning. So it's actually good to be a little stressed when you're learning something. To an extent, when you overdo it, it's just too much. It actually inhibits learning. So the way to do this is every once in a while when you're studying, just have a friend that comes in and just randomly scares the hell out of you, right? And then you'll relearn it, you'll relearn it way better. Right? And then beta endorphins. With that pathway with ACTH, what's a beta endorphin? Endorphin endogenous morphine. So it's going to turn up your endogenous morphine. It's help you deal with, with pain a little bit better because they're secreted with the ACTH. 
So a stressor response in your body, your body releases epinephrine, norepinephrine, it releases uh, cortisol, and then it helps you deal with whatever that stressor is. Some non-specific responses or generalized response, responses could be what, doing what to your immune system? It depresses your immune system. So is it good to be stressed out all the time? No. When you're stressed out a lot, what has a tendency to happen to you? You get sick. And it seemed like when I was an undergrad, I was constantly getting sick around finals week. It always sucked because you're on vacation the next week, right? And then you're sick for vacation. All right, so role of other hormone responses and stress. You already know blood sugar goes up. Fatty acids are going to go up. Insulin is what? Excited or suppressed? It's suppressed. Insulin is trying to do what to sugar? It's trying to put it in the cells. What are the other hormones trying to do? Bring it out of the cells. So insulin's outnumbered here. And we haven't talked about this hormone yet, but glucagon is actually going to get turned up. Glucagon raises your blood sugar. So now you have three hormones that are raising your blood sugar. So in stressful situations, you might start looking like a diabetic. Yeah. And then maintenance of blood volume and pressure through increased renin, angiotensin, aldosterone, and vasopressin activity, which we talked about back with renal and cardiovascular. All right. And then, you know, angiotensin 2 and vasopressin spike your blood pressure because both of them cause your blood vessels to do what? Constrict. Yep. And then vasopressin, other than facilitating learning, which is interesting, it also, yep, it helps you with learning. And so my theory is, and I don't know why I keep popping back to sex today, but anyway, vasopressin increases release after a male has orgasms. So it's the best to study after sex if you're a man. What hormone does it cause women to release? Oxytocin. Oxytocin, yeah. Not fair at all. So we're brilliant after sex. And you're just lovey. <laughs> Cuddly and clingy. We're so brilliant, we can't, we're thinking so hard, we just want to take a nap. Okay. <laughs> and then all this is coordinated by one organ, the hypothalamus. It's the master gland. It regulates everything else, including homeostasis. So if you look at the stressor, the way it works in the hypothalamus, it releases, releases CRH. It sends that sympathetic stimuli down to the adrenal medulla. And then it also releases that vasopressin to help you think better and also retain water to increase your blood pressure. So you can see that long flow of events. Okay, and then activation of the stress response. Like I said before, chronic psychosocial events can do this. Back in the day, stress was because of some physical effect that was coming after you. You were being hunted by an animal or chased by an animal. But nowadays, when you're sitting at the computer and you don't see something you like, you start getting that stress response. When somebody says something they don't like, you get the stress response. When you're driving down your car and somebody cuts you off, you get the stress response. It's a lot of other things that aren't, you know, they're kind of trivial compared to being eaten by a bear. But and when you have chronic stress, all those problems, your blood sugar stays pretty high, but unfortunately, your immune system's suppressed. You start storing fat in weird places. It's just bad news. Okay, so which hormone would not be increased during stress response? Number two, why? Because insulin is suppressed by the others. Yep. Insulin's inhibited by the others, like epinephrine and cortisol. Okay, so while we're talking about fuel, when we talk about metabolism and intermediary metabolism, metabolism is a very generic term. And in layperson's terms, we're usually talking about people that are exercising and cranking up their metabolism. But metabolism technically in scientific terms has two sides. It's like a coin with two sides. Metabolism can be increasing calorie burning, but metabolism can actually decrease calorie burning to an extent too. When it's decreasing, it's because it's storing those calories. When it's increasing, it's because it's doing what to the calories? Burning, burning it. The two terms to get familiar with are anabolism and catabolism. When you hear about an anabolic chemical, what's it usually doing? It's building something, like anabolic steroids cause you to build muscle strength and bulk. Catabolism, when I see that, I think catastrophic. Anything that's catastrophic is what? Constructive? Building? It's destroying things, right? When you hear about catastrophic events, something was destroyed. So catabolism is destroying something. So if I just gave you an example of sugar, what would be a form of sugar anabolism? 
What's it building? What's it storing as? Let me say it that way. As glycogen. What would catabolizing a sugar be? Breaking it down to make energy or glucose itself, right? So if I'm saying um, fat anabolism, what am I doing with fat? I'm storing it. I'm putting it in what type of cells? Adipose tel cells. And if I'm catabolizing it, what am I doing? I'm pulling it back out of the adipose cells and releasing it into the blood as free fatty acids. So anabolism and catabolism. When you hear intermediary metabolism, they're talking about what happens to proteins, carbs, and fats in general. So know what's going on with anabolism, catabolism with proteins, carbs, and fats. We just talked about carb and fat. What about protein? If you're catabolizing a protein, what are you doing to it? You're breaking it down from what part of your body? Muscle. muscle. If you're anabolizing a protein, you're building muscle, yeah. building it up. Right. And then when we talk about essential nutrients, anything that's essential you can't make. Like there are some essential amino acids, which means how do you get them? You have to get them through diet. You have to. And then you can take and turn them into something else in your body through an anabolic process, but you have to get them through your diet. Okay. And then we already talked about this. There's the conversion between the two. Glucose to glycogen or vice versa. If it's glucose to glycogen, it's what? Anabolic or catabolic? Anabolic. So what hormone are we responsible for being anabolic for glucose to glycogen? What's the first one that pops in your head? Insulin. Insulin stores up. It's an anabolic hormone. What about a hormone that pops in your head that takes glycogen and breaks it into glucose to put it in the blood? Cortisol is the one that pops in my mind. What else could it be? What was the other hormone that I said releases sugar into your blood? Epinephrine, yep. And then I mentioned just briefly glycogen, which we'll talk about later. But those are cata catabolic. And then fatty acids turn to triglycerides when you're storing them. And then the triglycerides from the adipose tissue turn back into fatty acids to use them. Amino acids from your diet turn into proteins. And then you can catabolize those proteins and turn them back into amino acids if you need them. So big old pathway that you saw this before. You saw it when we talked about the digestive tract. But you digest the food, you bring it into your body, you turn it into those basic mono components like amino acids, monoglycerides and free fatty acids, and then monosaccharides. You put them in this big metabolic pool that's in your blood, and you can convert them. Amino acids can be turned into proteins. Amino acids can be turned into glucose with that nasty side effect. You can turn glucose into sugars like glycogen. You can turn glucose into fatty acids and store them as adipose tissue. You can take fatty acids and convert them back and forth. It's a really interesting but really complex pathway that we're not going to make you memorize. Okay, so the brain has to continuously be supplied with glucose. Why? Why does it always have to be supplied with glucose? Because it can't store it. It can't store sugar. It has to always be provided with sugar. If you cut the brain off from sugar, you've got about five minutes before it starts shutting down. And then ideally, you keep it between 70 and 110, right around 80 or 90 is actually ideal, ideal. Okay, and then the absorptive state, after you eat a meal, you go into this absorptive state. You take all these nutrients, you put them into your blood, now you have high levels of sugar, amino acids, and, and uh, fatty acids. What are you going to do with those things when they're high in your blood? You're going to try and do what? If you're not running through your life, do you need them in your blood high? Nope, you're going to try and store them as fats, glycogen, or protein. Yep. And then the post-absorptive state, that means you ate a meal like four hours ago. There's nothing left to absorb from that meal. So you're still burning sugar. What's going to happen to your, sugar, your blood sugar four hours later? It's going to start dropping. What are you going to do in response to that drop in blood sugar? You have to release the stored stuff, and that's called the post-absorptive state. So in the absorptive state, you fall into an anabolic phase where you're, you're taking all the stuff in your blood and you're storing it for later. And then in the post-absorptive state, the starved fate state is what they call it too. When you're starving, you haven't eaten for four hours. Then you take all that storage form and break it back into its original free components. And they call absorptive state the fed state too. Like I just ate fed.
Okay. And then the tissues you have to know, we've already talked about this. And when I mentioned the liver before, what did I say it was good at storing for you? Sugars. It's great at storing sugars. It stores up a lot of glycogen, it can store some fats and amino acids so that later bing, you can make the sugar really quick. So the liver is the primary site that's going to help you store sugars. The adipose tissue, primary site to help you store fat. Yep. And the muscle, primary site to store protein. And the brain's primary site to store nothing. Right? So what you want to remember with the brain is that the brain depends on you providing these nutrients from other storage sites. And then those ketone bodies, typically they're bad. If you're really low on sugar, your body, your brain can actually use some of the ketone bodies, but it's almost like um, you're running on fumes. And it's just taking these ketone bodies, and unfortunately when you're running on fumes, if you look at your tailpipe, what's coming out of the tailpipe? Like s black smoke and crap, right? So these ketone bodies, when you burn those for that last bit of energy, they're making even nastier side products. So when you oxidize them and then try and make them into an energy form, the brain starts spitting this really toxic form out in your body and it can actually kill you. So you have this temporary ability with your brain to use ketone and acids, but too much of them, bad news. All right, the organ responsible for metabolic state concerning amino acids is adipose, liver, brain, or muscle? It's the muscle, right? Adipose is primarily for fat, liver for sugar, and the brain for nothing. It's worthless. I'm just kidding. All right, and then the pancreas. When did we talk about the pancreas last? Digestion. digestion. What, we, what did we focus on back in digestion? We focused on enzymes, which are what? Endo or exo? Exocrine, right? This time we're focusing on endocrine. You already know the anatomy. You know where it's located. Um, the function, endocrine and exocrine. We already discussed the exocrine, which you have to know all of that stuff. So the exocrine pan pancreas makes those proteases, the lipases, and the what? What was the third thing that it makes? Protease for protein, lipase for fats, lipids, and what was the carbohydrate one? Started with, didn't start with a C. And you make it in your mouth, too. Amylase. Yep, the amylase. Okay, so the endocrine pan pancreas. These little cells are called islets of Langerhans. And I thought I had a picture there. I guess I don't. Dang it. So there are four types of cells in the islets. The islets are isolated. Your pancreas, it's about 99% there for exocrine. 1% is there to make these hormones. And the four cells you absolutely positively have to know are first the alpha cells. Alphas make glucagon. Every time I see glucagon, I always think of an infomercial. Like, that's really loud. I thought it was thunder at first, but... Anyway, the glucagon, it's there, like in an infomercial. Is your glucose gone? Get glucagon, right? Because if your glucose is gone, what do you want to do? You want to make more, right? So what, what organ is glucagon going to primarily work on? If your blood sugar is low, your glucose is gone, it's going to go where? To the liver. And it's going to pull out that stored sugar. It's going to cause the liver to start cranking out sugar. All right. The beta cells, anybody know what hormone that releases? Insulin. You should get used to it. Is, insulin, is diabetes a big problem in the United States? Does somebody say no. Not for me. Right. So beta cells make insulin <laughs> and we'll talk about diabetes and why the beta cells are so significant and then the delta cells make something called somatostatin have you heard of it yeah. this is the third time you've heard of that chemical what do you know it does it stops everything what's it going to do to alpha cells stop them what's it going to do to beta cells stops them it's kind of like the emergency brake in your car. You don't use it all the time, but man, it's good to have so that nothing get, you know, your car doesn't get rolling down the road when you're not in it. So the delta cells try and stop everything. What's it going to do to your appetite? Stop it. Yep. It stops everything. What's it going to do to growth hormone? Stop it again. Is the pancreas the only place that the somatostatin is made? No. It's also made in the. Starts with an H. <coughs> Hypothalamus. Yep. 
And the last one is the F cells, also known as the PP cells. It just sounds <coughs> fun to say that, the PP cells. And they make pancreatic polypeptides. These are appetite suppressants too, pancreatic polypeptides. So they go to what part of the brain to tell it stop eating? Hypothalamus again, pancreatic polypeptides. All right, we're running out of time. We'll get started with insulin, but we'll probably have to stop on it. So insulin structure and synthesis, what is it? What class is it? You already know this because I spent like four slides telling you. Protein, Protein peptide. So how does it start? Pre-pro-insulin, Pre a big form. It gets cleaved to pro-insulin, and then it gets cleaved to insulin as it's released. So it starts as a pre-pro, goes to pro, and then releases an active form of insulin. Why is it released? Because your blood sugar's too high. What do they call that when your sugar's too high, your blood sugar? Hyperglycemia. Yep. So the primary determinant of insulin release is hyperglycemia. So what's its overall goal? If it came out because you had high blood sugar, its goal is to lower the blood sugar. What's it make you do? Urinate all that sugar out? No, it makes you do what with the sugar? That natural resource you don't want to lose. Store it. It makes you store it. So it goes to cells and tells the cells start pulling the sugar in and storing the cell, storing it in the cells. So its effect lowers the blood levels of glucose, lowers the blood levels of fatty acids. So what's it going to do to the fatty acids? Store them as adipose tissue. And then what's it going to do to amino acids? Sorry, it lowers the blood amino acids. What's it going to do to them then? Store them as Muscle, yep, that's protein muscle. What would you call insulin then? A catabolic or anabolic hormone? Everything about it is anabolic. Its whole purpose is to help you store up things. Sugars, fats, and, and uh, proteins. Okay, so here's the main secretors when you're building your pathway. The stimulators, double star, double star, must be important high blood glucose, which is called hyperglycemia. Okay. Having high amino acids, if you have way high levels of amino acids, your insulin comes out because it's going, wow, we have all this extra stuff, let's be productive with it, and it starts storing it as muscle. And then if you have high fatty acids, it says, whoa, way too many fatty acids out there stored as fat. Okay. The GI hormones are also important. In other words, when you just ate, why would that cause you to release more insulin? You just ate because you know that you're going to spike the levels of all three of these, aminos, uh, sugars, and carbs. Or I already said carbs. And uh, thank you, fats. Right. This next one actually goes with letter D. Why does acetylcholine go along with gastrointestinal hormones? What's acetylcholine associated with typically? Sympathetic or parasympathetic? Parasympathetic. Why? What's it do to your GI tract? It speeds it up, right? So when the parasympathetic nervous system stimulates the pancreas, it's going to make you dump out insulin at the same time as helping you get ready to, to absorb food. So final ureas, these are actually chemicals that you can take. So like if you have insulin regulation problems, like you can't release insulin, you can take this to help stimulate your own insulin production. And this is an interesting one, glucagon. What did I tell you glucagon does? Glucagon goes to the liver and makes what happened to your blood sugars? It makes them go up. But wait a minute, why would that stimulate the release of insulin? Because you're about to have high blood sugar. So insulin comes out and it's, it's almost like it warns insulin. It says, you know what? I'm going to come out and I'm going to release a lot of sugar. Let's see if you can compete with me. So it tries to keep it. As you bring out glucagon to raise your blood sugar so that you don't get a big spike in blood sugar, it slowly starts releasing the insulin too to help regulate things, to ideally keep it balanced. Okay. And then growth hormone. The reason that growth hormone helps stimulate insulin is because growth hormone is also an anabolic hormone. Growth hormone stimulates insulin release just because it wants to help store up amino acids. That's the only reason. So normally growth hormone actually opposes insulin, but in this situation when all these free amino acids are out there, the growth hormone says, okay, I've got to act anabolically and I'm going to ask insulin to help me store these 
things as protein. Right, and then to a smaller extent, the cortisol, and to an even lesser extent, progesterone and estrogen. So the main ones you really want to focus on are actually these top, what is it, five? The top five. Blood sugar, blood amino acids, blood fatty acids, and then the GI tract, the two GI tract issues. Those are the main regulators that are going to have the most powerful impact. And that's where we're going to have to stop. Sure. There is no F spot on the if there's no F spot, leave all of them blanking, right? F afterwards. <laughs>